committee. And Ms. Wood, I think your daughter is a rock star, and I'm glad you brought her today. Thanks so much. Before I ever thought of running for Congress, my husband and I sold everything we owned and we moved to Romania to serve as missionaries. Even though the Iron Curtain had fallen, the effects of communism could still be felt and seen all over the country during our four years living there. We started working with organizations to help impoverished kids, some of whom lived in the sewers below ground and many of whom were victims of communist rule. We helped set up a leadership training institute for young people to teach them the skills they needed to succeed. And we also got involved with providing medical supplies for children at the country's only burn unit. One day my husband and I received a frantic call from a doctor and he said, the government just shut off the supply of antibiotics and children in this burn unit are dying. I don't have the antibiotics, they're trying to make a point. Fortunately, I knew somebody at Eli Lilly in my home state of Indiana and they worked with us to get these life-saving antibiotics where they were needed. Years later, here, I had the opportunity to serve on the House Veterans Affairs Committee for four years. During that time, we uncovered unbelievable, real stories on long wait times, secret lists, and outdated IT systems, not in Romania, right here in this country through the VA a government-run health care program. According to the 2015 VA OIG report, more than 300,000 American military veterans likely died while waiting for VA care, with some of their applications dating back nearly two decades. In my own congressional office, veterans asking for help dealing with the VA continues to be our most common number one constituent casework. We continually battle the bureaucrats at the VA to ensure that veterans get help in this country, the care they deserve and earned right now. From impoverished children abroad to our brave veterans here at home, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it, the damage government-run health care can do. I've seen bureaucratic failures and top-down controls that prevents patients from getting the care they need. I've battled for them. I've battled to save their lives. Forcing every American off their private or employee-sponsored insurance plans into a top-down, one-size-fits-all system like Medicare for All would be a disaster. It would be especially harmful to patients with pre-existing conditions who would bear the brunt of doctor shortages, wait lists, bureaucratic dysfunction, and budgetary cutbacks. Promoting Medicare for All is easy to sell as a campaign slogan. I know it is, but it's a certain failure in practice. It's administratively and fiscally impossible to implement. We still can't handle our own veterans in this country. And it's a guaranteed path to preventing hardworking folks from getting the health care that they and their families need. That's not what the American people want. What they want is a system that puts control back in their own hands and puts the needs of their patient first. Ms. Turner, under the plans that we've seen proposed, services would be available to everyone with no cost uh, sharing whatsoever, which is more extreme than any other country with a similar system. This increases demand for health services regardless of their necessity, decreases supply of medical providers due to steep reimbursement cuts. A government-owned and operated system like this may not be able to address issues at all with chronically ill patients with multiple pre-existing conditions. Understanding the single-payer system generally has wait lists for care, do you think that the most vulnerable patients stand to lose the most under this proposal? Absolutely, and the Congressional Budget Office agrees because it believes that the cuts in payments to even get to a $32 trillion cost would lead to shortage of providers, longer wait times, changes in the quality of care, and they expect a substantial increase in patient demand, which further exacerbates the waiting lines and the, the much less investment in new technologies and new equipment. Thank you. And I want to just say this in closing. I got a call one night from a young veteran woman whose husband was dying at a VA, lack of care. And I called the VA secretary myself because I had a cell phone number. And I said to him, Mr. Secretary, if you don't save the life of this veteran for my district, I want to meet you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning in Indianapolis and I'm calling for your resignation. And I took on that VA secretary. And the, and the gigantic bureaucracy that exists here that took the lives of so many fighters that fought for our freedom. 
I've been here, I've done it, I lived through it, and I've saved their lives. And I can't see doing this to all of our American people. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Washington State.